Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Blinas, and I am based in Austin, Texas, but our company was originally founded here in Sydney, and our, actually, our office is literally two blocks from here. I, I forgot all the banners, so I had to go back this morning. Anyway, um, I wanted to kind of bring to you a set of knowledge and just, you know, we, we operate in the world of e-commerce, and so our daily lives are spent on figuring out what trends are driving the way people shop, what new technologies are getting relied upon and expected throughout the shopping and buying experience. And really, our mission is to help brands go from where they're at today to actually scale further to where they uh, aspirationally want to get to. So today's talk is, is really just about um, high-level trends that we've been seeing, both on the brand side and on the consumer side, that really great to just share and start implementing into your strategies. Sorry. All right, so found this stat online. It was a, a Medium article. It was, it was really interesting. Um, but basically, 95% of your shopping decisions are, are all subconsciously. And so what your brain does is that it tries to make an intuitive decision that's then communicated via an emotion to your, your conscious mind. And then your conscious mind says, OK, cool. That thing happened. I felt this thing. Now I'm trying to justify it with logic and reason. And so that's very cyclical as, as to how we shop online. And so <clears throat> expectations of consumers and shoppers online in general are, are shifting. So it's great you've got a website. That's huge. It's great you've got a website that you can shop on. That's huge, too. That has been pretty uh, typical for the last decade or so. And consumer experiences are no longer, like if you want to lean into this very emotional based reaction, rather than just like, I've made the conscious decision to start shopping, but rather I was already browsing and shopping happened to be part of that experience. That's, that's the big horizon here. And so expectations are no longer, I've made the decision to go view a website, I've made the decision to start shopping, but a blended experience. And so content and commerce just very inextricably linked. Um, but the big point here is that there's, there's no silver bullet. It's, it's little components that you can add to your strategy that help level this up. And so <clears throat> this is a quote that I, <laughs> I didn't want to butcher. And I also didn't want to just read off the slide. So yeah, sorry, it's super cheesy and attributed to me. But um, yeah, it's, it's no longer a transactional activity. It's, it's an end-to-end -end emotional experience that you know, results in a positive customer response that results in, you know, site traffic, loyal brand, uh, consumer, and, you know, a very happy user that tells friends. So three things that I want you guys to get from this session today. Wow, this looks like six with <laughs> the dual screens. <laughs> so six things I want you to learn. Um, <laughs> I want you to gain knowledge from, you know, just what I have to ramble on for the next 40 minutes about. Um, discover references, and apologies, I tried to mix in as many Australian brands I could think of in my, my references, so I'll, I'll, I'll provide the context for the brands that I'll kind of show you. And then just learning how to implement these into your own brand, your own experience, and everything that you guys know how to do well. So first one is building your trust funnel, and I have a slide at the end that shows my dogs, but literally those are my dogs. Um, I've got two big English cream golden retrievers. Um, <clears throat> so as I was saying, content and commerce aren't separate anymore. And actually, the great part about WordPress is that you guys have <laughs> dominated the world of content. SEO is baked into your DNA. Like that's, that's something that can't be replicated, that brands that are typically just in the, on the commerce side are desperately trying to figure out how to replicate these days. And so, <coughs> excuse me, you guys already have a leg up in that this is the community of WordPress. Um, brands are actually actively trying to play catch up now. So historic, historically, um, uh, commerce focused brands think the industry titans of the world like Procter's Gamble, things like that. They're trying to lean into the trends that are actually <laughs> putting them in a tough spot, like Dollar Shave Club or Stray Whisker or, you know, these packaged consumer or uh, consumer packaged good models that sell direct. So have you guys been bombarded with you should buy this mattress in a box online ads or 
po possibly have bought one. I've personally bought two in the last five years. Um, that's the type of model that uh, you guys can lean into because it, it's not that I made the decision to go shop for a mattress. It was an ad was put in front of me that shows like the favorite mattress company that I like is, is Purple. And it, like, I, I just love seeing the egg drop tests onto their Purple Springs. And so like, I never asked the internet to show me <laughs> if an egg can survive me landing on top of it on top of a mattress, but that's what was put in front of me. And it led my curiosity to go, wait, hold on, what is this? Oh wait, you had engineers from NASA build this thing. You've got a patent. And all of a sudden, I have all this information and I'm well down the purchase funnel for something that I wasn't even in the market for, but it was an emotional response to this cool experience that was kind of put in front of me. Um, and that's, that's what you're trying to recreate within your brands and on your sites. Um, and to that end, millennials are the, uh, well, they're, they're annoying, I'm one of them, so apologies. But um, we've grown up in an era where we've been bombarded with ads, like our entire existence has been the model of you get this free thing at the cost and expense of ads and we're very good at responding to those in a negative way and so you have to actually put something in front of this generation that actually makes them want to learn more that educates them that creates you know a certain type of value for them <coughs> excuse me i'm gonna get some water quick um good example of this is uh have you guys uh, consumed the website, The Wire Cutter? It was actually bought by the New York Times. And it's, it's one of these things where, again, they, they, have, they do product reviews. And not just like, oh, I reviewed this product, but like, they tell me why this person is important. They added all this context about their history and how they were an audiophile, or they were a homemaker for 20 years, or you know, they're a nanny. And it's, it's basically a, a thesis on why I should buy this ironing board. And, I, I say that because I literally bought an iron, ironing board out of <laughs> the compelling nature of this, this content. And so that's kind of like the, the crux of all this is you got to educate people. And like con being consumers of information makes it feel better as a person that, hey, I have now connected that emotional response to the experience, paired it with content and information. And now the logical outcome is, yes, I, I definitely need to be buying this. And so. You can create that for whatever your brand is. It's, it's, it's not limited to just, you know, dollar of the month razor clubs or mattress in a box. But did we ever think that we'd live in a world where you'd be buying a mattress in a box online? Probably not. <clears throat> so three brands doing this well. Again, six brands, I guess. Um, these are all, actually, I don't know where uh, the first two are based. But Uncrate is a site that gets about a million and a half views a month. They have a record of over 9,000 products that they've sourced across the globe. And what they do is they're not just saying, hey, we found this cool thing, come buy it. They're writing content around these things. So like, hey, weekend camping trip in a, a tropical climate filled with rich photography, um, information on how to do uh, proper like tent setup. And then guess what? There's a link to, hey, you can buy this tent or you can purchase this uh, flare gun, things like that. <laughs> um, Gear Patrol, let's see, this is actually, this is an interesting one because on the flip side of the uh, legacy kind of uh, uh, shopping or uh, merchant side trying to add content, you also have the inverse which is how do I make the shift from being a very content centric site and adding commerce into that experience. And, um, Gear Patrol is actually, they're, they're a Hearst company, so like the, the Hearst Global Magazine conglomerate. Um, they do the same thing. They painstakingly shop for um, the right products. Let me see what they call it. They said they're pioneers in what they call product journalism, which is kind of interesting because there's a whole market now around <laughs> being a journalist and writing about cool products that you've found that... Like, it doesn't matter if you're the first one to find it or not. The fact that you took time to compare it to other things, to write up a, a thought piece, to give your perspective on it, and then actually get that affiliate link and you know, that commerce experience back to you. So the more that you can link content and commerce together, the better site traffic you're going to have, the better conversions you're going to see for your business. And yeah, it's pretty cool. 
So recap of this, educate and build trust, stop advertising products, kind of change your model on how you do that, and build trust through content and experiences. So second one, this is <laughs> instant gratification. Um, I'll spare you the dolphin right now. <laughs> um, so like it or not, <clears throat> expectations of shoppers online have been set outside of your control. There was never a, a meeting that assembled and said, hey, we're all going to now offer two-day shipping for free. It's basically a world in which you're like, crap, how, how am I going to compete with that? And the answer is, it's not something that you have to compete with. Amazon came up with the model that free two-day shipping is their version of best. And for them, best equals getting your products to you as fast as you can for the cheapest. That doesn't mean that your business has to lean into that, cut into your margins, ruin you know, your profits for the year. But you have to define what's best for your business. And that can take many different forms. So um, you know, overall goals for defining what's best, you should be memorable. You could try to save people money. You make their shopping experience more convenient. And so I'll, I'll get into that in the example slide. Um, but it's important to remember, too, that even after you've made that sale, your branded experience doesn't end there. So just because you aren't offering free two-day shipping, maybe you offer $4.99 flat rate shipping that gets it there in seven days. As long as you can be upfront about what parameters you're setting, people are fine with that. But you have to deliver within those if you want them to come back and have that be memorable. Um, deliver something that's unexpected. Get a box. <clears throat> Again, I'll show you on the next slide, but uh, there's a story behind the shirt, too. So. Um, you want the experience to continue after sale because if it's just a transaction, they're not going to remember you. It's more of a, a utility that you've provided for them, a means to an end to get an object that had no emotional impact on your life. And so your version of best should extend even beyond getting them to your site and having that transaction take place. And then you know the third point is don't hide anything. So what I mean by this is if you aren't offering free two-day shipping, that's fine. You just call out the terms. Have your terms for shipping be quite logical. Have your return instructions be favorable. Um, make yourself available to your customers. There's a reason why, like in the States right now, all the customer service companies of you know, Silicon Valley are IPOing like crazy because guess what? Optimal customer service, timely responses, and you know, friendly voices on the other end of the phone are are really critical in ensuring that people have the entire brand experience because buying something doesn't stop there. It's, it's an entire process to get them to come back to you. <clears throat> so these three brands are, uh, again, I, I apologize, not, not Australian brands, but they all have really unique stories and kind of interesting ways of what best is for their brand. So Dazzity or Dazzati, I honestly don't <laughs> know. Um, they sell foosball tables, they sell ping pong tables, pool tables, large objects that have plenty of assembly required, possibly freight. Like, why would you try to sell that online? You would think that you would just go to a sporting goods store, but they've been in business selling online for over a decade and they, they crush it because their version of best is first, okay, obviously big items, they provide freight shipping. So if you're ordering you know, pool tables for this building, that's going to be a doable thing. However, what about the moms and dads that are trying to surprise their kids at Christmas with a foosball table? They've thought of that. Their version of best is at checkout for like Christmas time, you can actually select um, like Secret Santa delivery and you put in special instructions of like when your kids are gonna be in bed and they'll show up at that right time, help you sneak it into your garage, help you assemble it in your house. Like these are all services that you can pay for. And so it's, it's that extra added touch of like, wow, that was totally unexpected and a huge relief for parents. Uh, Jenny's Ice Cream is, is kind of a cult brand in the US for, for ice cream. They've got very few locations, but they're, they're expanding. And you know, it, it's, it's you know, ice cream for hipsters, but it's, it's delicious. <laughs> um, they sell ice cream online. Like, we live in a world where you can sell ice cream online. And I kid you not, when you get a box of Jenny's Ice Cream, first of all, they took time in, all right, we're going to spend X cents more to get this very 
posh white box that has very, you know, tactile. Like, you've got to own the experience from when you pick it up at your doorstep to bringing it in the house. And so you open this box, and all of a sudden it's lined with orange on the inside, and it's like, wow, unexpected. And there's, you know, the styrofoam lid. It could have just been styrofoam, but it's branded Jenny's. And you lift it off, and it's just like this puff of, like, dry ice that just comes up. And it's, it's really cool. It's, if you order ice cream from them, you definitely go, wow, this was an experience that I want to even just tell my friends about or, like, put it back in and so I can Instagram it for later or send it to somebody as a gift because they're going to get that same impact. And so their version of best is that experience. And then Robert Graham is, well, the shirt that I'm wearing now. And these are kind of shirts where I, I really like to see them in person. And they had a flash sale because I've bought so many things from them. And so I, I got invited to this, you know, website where it, it just dropped the price significantly. And I bought the first two shirts from them online that I've ever bought. I normally buy them in retail. And it was like opening up a new Apple product when I got it. Um, it had like this white box. There was a little tab that had like, <laughs> like little embroidery and paisley on it. And you pull it out and it was just like gold, uh, 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 tissue paper and they were sealed with a note and it was just like wow like this felt special like the 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 excitement that I had for this shirt was then just multiplied by like how much effort they put into making sure that when that arrived it felt as good as it did buying it in the store and so find out what your best is and, and do that so this this recap is you know meet or beat your shopper expectations brand your post sale experiences and be honest and reachable So as you're gaining traction with your brands and trying to figure out how do I get, maybe you're at that point where you're like, hey, we're doing 10,000 in sales a month, or maybe I'm trying to get from 1 million in sales a year to 10 million a year. You've got to start looking at what the different channels are. And so um, I'll preface this by saying that, you know, I understand that Amazon is kind of having the same success as Starbucks did here. So don't, don't knock me for that, but I'll, I'll speak to it <laughs> regardless. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things going on with the titans of the world. So there's a reason why Facebook, Amazon, Instagram, Walmart, they're all radically investing copious amounts of cash into their products because for these types of businesses, whoever owns the most data, the most digestible, dissectable, sellable, targetable data in the world is going to win in the eyes of Wall Street. And the winner in the eyes of Wall Street is going to trickle down to what brand consumers trust or rely on and go to more frequently. And so regardless if you agree with their approach to their business models or not, they're, they're happening. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't benefit from the work that they're putting into it. So <clears throat> with, when it comes to things like, um, like Amazon, Amazon has built now an ad network within Amazon because they know that when you search for backpacks and there are 9,000 options, like your backpack that's listed at you know, line 8,000 might not have the visibility that somebody at the top would. But guess what? For five bucks a day, you can advertise for a specific keyword for backpacks. So all of a sudden, you're a recommended brand. They're, they're recreating what Google, Google does with you know, uh, PPC and paid search and things like that. Uh, Facebook's doing a really interesting thing right now. So last two years, they've, <laughs> they, they literally opened up an office a block away from Amazon headquarters in Seattle. And they've been hiring engineers, product managers, developers for the last two years. And so they've got a team of about two, two to 300 people right now that are working on Facebook Marketplace. So Facebook Marketplace is Facebook's answer to Amazon. They wanna build a network where a brand can come and connect. And rather than like when you're scrolling through your Facebook feed, it's your friends. What if you had the equivalent of scrolling through brands that you've shopped for before? And you can see almost like in real time, like a, a new blog post, oh, they posted this new pair of socks, or hey, these sho shoes are kinda cool. and the, the redirects are killing them, and so they want brands to come to them and plug into this. So again, money being spent to try to facilitate sales is something that you can and should be leaning into. And then shopping on Instagram, that's been just a runaway success. And so 
Um, you can now, much like you would tag a person on Instagram, you can tag a product and that shopping experience takes place right within Instagram. And so it's now live in, I think, 45 countries. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, and then what else did I have in here? Yeah, no, that, that was about it. Um, brands doing this well. And I swear there are Australian brands in my presentation. We'll, we'll get there eventually. But um, Spearmint Love sold baby clothing. And they had. They started as kind of like a, a, a hot mommy blog. Like there were a lot of tips for new mothers trying to, you know, figure out how to <laughs> raise a, a newborn child. And what they did was they started creating uh, clothing, and it, you know, kind of took took uh, center stage for their business to create awesome uh, clothing for babies. And what they did was they actually um, leaned into Facebook ads, shopping on Instagram, and even before Facebook Marketplace, just selling directly on Facebook. And for them, they, um, so we've worked closely with them, I'm trying to get the numbers right. Yeah, they had 14% um, return on their, their ad spend, and it, it actually had a 12% year-over-year growth for their business when they just started spending money on ads and advertising. Not the products, but rather the, you know, cute kids wearing products or moms really would benefit from this or just, you know, it, it's that emotional appeal. Um, Native Union, they make awesome secondary or third party um, iPhone cables, cases, things like that. Um, they're a brand that's actually, you know, doing quite well there. You can buy them, I don't know, in uh, the Apple stores in uh, Australia, but in the US, they're, you know, one of the higher end third party products. They started uh, selling their products directly on Instagram. So this is what I'm talking about where you just, you tap here, and rather than a redirect out to a third page that you then have to click through and do that, this pop pops open a new page, and right there, you can shop and complete the transaction within Instagram. <clears throat> when they turned this on, they had a 26,000% increase in traffic from Instagram to their pages, and that resulted in a huge increase of revenue. And then Beach RC is, you know, if you happen to uh, enjoy remote control car racing. This is, you know, you can get really into this. So there are thousands of parts and accessories and things that you can do to build up, um, you know, your different kits. And they were selling direct on their site and doing just fine. And they went, hey, maybe we should sell on Amazon. Connected their product to selling on Amazon. And they, like within the first month, they, they averaged adding like $17,000 in uh, sales per month, which almost, uh, it was like a hundred and, let me see, 171 percent increase in their overall sales for that year alone. And so all of a sudden, they're finding markets of people that they didn't know existed and continuing to build their, their own kind of uh, overall customer base and customer funnel through networks that have made it easy for sellers to start saying, hey, my website's my hub, but what if I could attract audiences from these different channels and continue to grow my strategy like that? So recap here, don't fear Amazon, especially for ads and, oh, I didn't even mention fulfillment by Amazon, but yeah, just the ability to lean into, like let's say you did wanna do two day shipping for free, use FBA, it's a great option. Um, Facebook Marketplace and shopping on Instagram and then optimize for Google Shopping. So as I was mentioning in the very beginning, the worlds of content and commerce are now inextricably linked. And for me, that blending results in experience. And experience can mean different things depending on what your brand is. So <coughs> selling tangible goods online is difficult. So how does somebody who sells a sofa, something that you're going to sit on every day after work and has never been sat on before and you've never touched the fabric, how can you possibly sell that online? Like, there, there's a lot of things that you can solve through an emotional response. Again, like going back to the mattresses in, in a box, like there is a way to tap into kind of the, what is the feature plus responded or expected outcome that you want from this? Uh, obviously, like with a mattress in a box, it's okay. It, it is a king size, it is softer, it comes in a box. Like those are all features, but the benefits are like, 
it cradles your spine, it, it supports your back, it comes in a box. <laughs> and like, how do you recreate that online? And so you gotta make shoppers feel something. And uh, two examples of this that you know, are just perfect examples actually, Red Bull and like GoPro. Like they've gone full on with experience. Like they've, they've created a lifestyle. And so when you think Red Bull, you think energy, high octane, like high, high uh, extreme sports. With GoPro, you think outdoor activity and you know, uh, people doing awesome things. And if you've ever bought a GoPro like me, it's turned into more like, what does my dog do during the day? Or, <laughs> but you know, they, they've sold me on that experience to the point where I went and said, yeah, I definitely could go kayaking over a waterfall. Like that's, that's in my bucket list. <laughs> um, in addition to having that emotional experience that you know kind of re relates to an activity, you also want to make sure that the experience of actually navigating a website is as easy and as simple as possible. And if you can add something of value that is just kind of differentiated, because everybody's got a hamburger menu, everybody's got a mobile responsive site. I hope everyone has a mobile responsive site by now. Um, scrolling is is simple, but you can do unique things, and I'll show you on the next slide, where it, there's that fine line of, is this too cheesy, or is this you know, something that added a unique quality to my site experience that kind of differentiates me from the next person over? And then the last bit here is personalization. And the, honestly, the best way to personalize site experiences is through automation. And common misconception is that doing site personalization for shopping is, is difficult and it's granular to the point where like, okay, I know that he is based in Sydney, he is 26, he has bought X, Y, and Z. Like, you can get that granular and big brands do, but to do personalization at uh, you know, a level that's maintainable for you know, what level of business that you have today, it's simple things. I would honestly start by like going, okay, who has bought something for me in the last year? This is a cohort. From that cohort, how many of those people have bought four things in the la or one thing per month in the last year? That's there. And then from those people who buy frequently, who are my big spenders? That's another cohort. And just something as simple as that, you can personalize shopper experience. So there's tools out there that you can use to say, cool, this person is a frequent shopper. At checkout, I'm going to tag them and make sure that when they come back next, they're going to get invited to you know, a special site, or they're going to see a 20% coupon. Or even outside of the web experience, just having that list of people that you can send special offers to through email, or when they buy something, they get you know, a, a set of sample products in their box that they weren't expecting. This little acts of personalization that you can add that make people go, oh, wow, that was, that was cool. I feel valued. I feel like this brand cares about me and what I'm uh, looking to do. So three examples of these kind of different experiences. Like, again, how do you sell headphones online? Headphones are, you know, very specific. I know you can go demo them at, you know, electronic stores, but like Skullcandy is, is they're the kind of brand that, like, they aren't competing with the Boses of the world. If you want Bose, quiet comfort, you know, that's, that's the executive brand. That's how they've positioned this. Skull Candy is deep, immersive, so all their colors are rich, they're vibrant. They really make you feel like you're like in them, in the experience. And so they push that you know, deep bass uh, experience and their site kind of conveys that throughout. Uh, Zenny Optical, before I had LASIK, this is, you know, this is again that borderline of uh, cheesy versus you know, practical, but they, they balanced it perfectly. So you can upload a photo of yourself and try on glasses. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, how else am I going to try on glasses or know how they're going to look on me if I haven't done something like this? And then finally, an Australian brand, but um, Bohemian Traders, <clears throat> they do a lot of personalization from uh, the cohort segmentation to rewarding their customers, et cetera. Um, yeah, so personalize, make browsing enjoyable, and reward your best customers. And then finally, mobile, mobile, mobile. If this is perpetually a trend, but you know, one thing that is just, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like this image a lot, but with mobile, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, Google. Yeah, so Google now factors in mobile site speed into their organic ranking algorithm. So anything that you can do to show that you know, your pages load faster, whether that's, you know, okay, I'm, I'm using correct uh, CDNs around the world that can load up images faster, or maybe you're using Akamai to optimize image size so that when it loads on your 3G uh, connected internet phone, it, it's in kilobytes, not a fully immersive image, things like that. Um, when visitors get to your site, how quickly can they find their way through your pages? How quickly do pages load? That impacts the overall both experience of the user and how Google wants you to uh, rank. And then making their exit as fast as possible. So did you know that, like this is a crazy stat, like there's a reason why it's very difficult to find reports on uh, mobile cart checkout abandonment online because nobody wants to talk about it. Like a good, conversion rate for somebody who has made it to the shopping cart on a mobile device and completes a sale is anywhere from like one to three percent. It's, it's ridiculously low. And so like everybody's doing that where, you know, oh, I heard this thing online or I'm in transit and, you know, I got there and it's like, oh, I don't want to fill out my information. Like anything you can do to help that add, you know, an autocomplete tool to help speed that along, have social logins to help fill out information faster. Um, any type of mobile payment wallet like Amazon Pay, Apple Pay, uh, uh, Afterpay, things like that. Anything to streamline that experience will help you convert more there. And three examples of this. Uh, really nation, it's buying shoes online. Shoes are very particular. You have to choose your style, um, the materials, the colors, the size. And for something that has so many different facets that you can choose from, They've done an incredible job of streamlining just the checkout experience, or the, the start to finish experience for buying a shoe online and making sure that you got the right size and feel good about it. NATO mounts, um, they sell like adhesive, or not adhesive, magnetic in-car mounts for your, your mobile phone. So like you've got a little sliver of magnetized plate, pop it in your car and you know, you're off in, to the races. They built their entire website like their, their desktop site is not the greatest, but that's because they built it entirely focused on mobile. And they advertise on Instagram and Facebook, and that's it. And they do millions of dollars a year. And they've, anything that they can do to increase the speed at which you can check out, get in and out of your, their site quicker, they will. And so that's why they have Amazon Pay and Apple Pay. Or, and these are all based on you know, what type of device you're loading. Maybe they have Google Pay if you're on an Android device. And then Zifa is, I mean, this is, this is literally just like a mouth guard for helping with like snoring and sleep apnea, but they get all their business from advertising on like podcasts and ESPN radio and, you know, things where it's an audio based ad. And where are you listening to that? You're, you're in commute, you're, igno you're pretending to work, you're, <laughs> um, you're on your mobile device. And so they made it stupid simple to check out. They, put it right on the home page. It's, it's made for that. So with mobile, optimize for speed. Definitely install the, uh, the Google AMP plugin. They're not paying me to say that, but anything that you can do to lean into the giant that controls search to help optimize your site for you know, better organic availability will definitely be well received. Uh, simplify your site nav and checkout and you know, lean into mobile wallets if, you, if you've got them. And that is everything. So there's my dog picture, in case any of you were wanting that. Okay, now it's time for questions. So please raise your hand and speak in the mic so we can get it on video. So anyone have any questions for Travis? Hi, Travis, Chris Mundy. Is there any way or has there been any study into the trends of Australian online uh, buyers, e-commerce buyers versus uh, US buyers? Uh, yeah, for Australian markets, it's, gosh, I'm gonna, well, so Afterpay is becoming increasingly popular. Like the adoption, I wish I would have or could have invested in Afterpay a few years ago. Just the, the speed at which it's gained traction and adoption across Australia and New Zealand is, is kind of incredible. Um, and then, uh, gosh, I can't even remember what the shipping, uh, get back to me, I'll, I'll have to look it up, but 
basically, the way you pay and the way you get things delivered are the two big things for Australian merchants that uh, they care about. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, to execute like mobile checkout to be quicker, how would you go about that? Um, what we've found is a one-page checkout is probably the most efficient way, just because you're not typing in information, clicking next screen, like, okay, is it guest or whatever? No, nope, next screen. Fill this out, next screen. It, it, the more that you have to load, the, the more the dropout drop-off happens. So one-page checkouts are great. Um, if you can incorporate buy buttons to your actual product pages so that you can actually use these speedy checkouts like Apple Pay or Amazon Pay, that's a good uh, thing. As far as just like the technical side, that's, that's not my uh, side of house that I can answer appropriately. Hi, uh, Travis. Uh, I noticed in a lot of your examples uh, there were e-commerce sites that sell physical products. What uh, trends are there for companies that sell digital goods? That's a good question. We don't do digital goods as well as we do physical goods, and uh, that's just something that we've never made a focus of our business. So honestly, my, my answers are, are just guesses at this point. So. Is there anybody else in the room that might sell digital goods themselves that has experience to share that? I feel we probably do have plug-in developers, theme developers, people that are selling that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Elliot. Uh, I sell uh, digital software. Um, was there any specific uh, question that I could? Just the trends in the past couple of years on conservative or mobile. Uh, yeah, I think from a developer's point of view, uh, creating the easiest step-by-step uh, -step process or, or the easiest kind of uh, flow through the checkout and through uh, the generation of like uh, API keys, download tokens and uh, improvements to uh, the kind of account area where someone can log in and, and view where their kind of uh, their plugins have been activated, stuff like that. That's where I've noticed a lot of uh, requests and uh, and uh, feature requests have come through for kind of improvements in that in that area yeah so I choose uh, WooCommerce super easy to customize um, but I know um, easy digital downloads is a really uh, a great solution as well I haven't played with that I just know that you can get anything done with WooCommerce super easy to use hi Travis your dogs are oh. really cute. <laughs> um, so I just tried to buy something online and I bailed at the, uh, the shipping because the shipping was a whopping $21 for two candles. So what, it, what is the, what is the buy-in for having shipping included versus shipping surprise at the end of the process? Like, are there any stats on people bailing because of shipping shock uh, like this? Yeah. Um, are there any stats around that? Uh, like, what are the what are the sort of the ideas around that, or what's yeah. best? What's best around that? Um, in my experience, and this is you're asking me for stats on the spot. Um, let me pull up some things after and I'll get those to you. But no, first, having options. Um, obviously, if you're a small business and you're selling candles and you know your margins are not great because you're just getting started, you do what you can. Um, whether that's maybe you offer a flat rate shipping and you kind of eat some of the cost, maybe you connect to a different, um, like in, in the States, like if you go through something like ShipStation or Shipper HQ, you can get better discounted rates as a merchant for delivering things like this to help offset some of your costs. And then the last thing is actually just providing options. So as long as it's not, that is my only option, $21 for candles, um, you, can, you can kind of 
curb that a little bit, but yeah, it, it adds to the overall abandonment for sure. Yeah, can I just, so I, I should be a bit more clear on my question is, is it better to include the cost of shipping and see the prices as more at, up front? So the candle could have been 30 bucks instead of 20 bucks and shipping's included. Yeah, definitely. Because like the candles were, were $25 and the, the, the shipping was $21 and it was the, the cheapest option. So it was a bad experience and obviously I bailed on it, but I've like where they say free shipping, but then they've bundled the cost of shipping into the actual prices. So there's a markup, significant markup on gotcha. the actual items that I know I can go to the shop and buy it like $5 or $10 cheaper. I find, like personally, I find I'd rather see the prices up front, but yep. I find that it jumps around depending on what retailer and how you're buying it and that kind of stuff. Yeah, if it's if it's a brand that is across multiple retailers and you know it's a physical product that you're just reselling, that's going to be a, a tougher margin to compete with. Um, if it's a unique product to you, definitely bake in that shipping cost into you know your product price points up front. Um, and like, I'll just give you this example. I know. Why do I know about the world of shipping and selling musical instruments online? I, I don't know, but uh, musical instrument sales are very particular. Like there are just razor thin margins. And so some way that people are competing around that because like you, if you get, you know, a, a, a Yamaha piano and everybody in the world has that, it's a race to who can get that indexed on Google first. Um, but the price points have to be within, you know, a, a few dollars and so it's tough to you know kind of be the dominant player of somebody who's selling the same piano around the world so what different businesses are doing is bundling so like it's a piano plus a music stand plus a stool and that way you actually get around the the standards that have been set by the the music instrument industry for you know what the margins can be and you've now sourced your own products and added that as a bundle and you can then use that as a way to kind of offset some of your shipping costs too. Uh, we've got time over here for just one more question and then we'll move on to the next session which is also in this room. Thank you. Oh, my question is, so for the smaller business, um, you mentioned most of them are using WordPress to build their own website to sell things. Uh, I'm wondering what's the market share or percentage compared to the bigger companies for example Amazon, uh, in terms uh, of like, uh, revenue just or using platforms and stuff. Um, uh, I mean, for example, for all the products sold online, how many percentage of them are actually just on Amazon, this big company? How, how many of them actually come from the um, smaller business or medium business, which is built on top of WordPress? Most gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so half of Amazon's business is not owning all of the products in the world. So that's why they, they have, uh, in, in Seller Central, they want to actually extend their product catalog because the more selection that they can have, the better experience that their shoppers have. So if you are a small business that has a unique product to you, that's when you uh, figure out your UPCs and SKUs and through Seller Central, you create an indexed item and own that product on Amazon. So then it can only come from you. All right, well, that's it. Let's give Travis a round of applause.